Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and knife collecting and hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, we take a look at a new Kubi in my collection. Uh, Best Tech taps new talent for a new Tanto. And then we take a look at daggers. Uh, daggers, oh daggers. I will define what I consider a dagger when we get there. Uh, I, I reference a book, a weapons book, that my brother and I had years and years ago uh, that I recently bought here. And uh, they refer to daggers in a very loose and open way. I do not. So we will get down to that in a while. But first, let's do a pocket check. And kind of apropos to this pocket check is something that's dagger-like, but is definitely not a dagger. Uh, that is my Boker Smatchet. Uh, the Smatchet was a 13-inch bladed double-edged uh, knife made for combat for fighting it was not a utility knife it was made for fighting uh double-edged uh given to rangers and various uh, special troops in world war ii uh, i know a lot of a lot of those ended up in the south pacific in any case a classic blade and uh reimagined by boker knives and chuck gadritis chuck gadritis an amazing uh custom knife maker who every every knife is unique with this guy uh really really cool stuff from chuck gadritis uh and this design a little bit off of his um usual uh sort of uh fair his knives tend to either be slender uh very ornate uh, automatics or he does those uh those switch army knife uh, automatics that look little automatics that look like swiss army knives whoops sorry about that Really great action, very bad deployment on my on my side here. Uh, but this sort of big, bold smatch it, uh, I just think he nailed it. If you're going to take a big combat knife, a big double-edged, nearly short sword of a knife, and turn it into a folder, uh, I think he did the design just right. But why do I say it's not a dagger? It has a lot of daggery uh, elements to it. It's got a symmetrical spear point blade. That's a big part of a dagger to me. Uh, and it's got a um a bevel on the top edge just as it does on the bottom edge however naturally this is a um a folder and it is not a specialized folder and that is a quite a broad blade so it does not disappear in the handle you cannot make this a double edge sorry i don't know why i can't open this with my left hand uh but uh so this is not a dagger. It's a dagger-like object, a beautiful blade. I love this thing. And actually, here, let me switch to my right hand so you can see how wonderfully it deploys. Just a gentle suggestion from your thumb, and it flies out on that bearing pivot. Uh, that's VG10 blade steel. You can see Chuck Cadritis' uh, maker's mark. This was a gift from my good buddy Dave at this old sword blade reviews. Uh, look at this uh, sort of art deco clip. I really like the design of that clip. And then, of course, the beautiful wooden scales. I, I think this is rosewood, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Rosewood like the fretboard of a guitar. Uh, really, really beautifully done. That knife also comes in uh, several delicious colors of micarta, which uh, if you've ever had Boker micarta, they use really good micarta that tends to take on a nice patina. So uh, highly recommend that non-dagger, dagger-like knife. Very cool. Uh, second knife on me today. Uh, I'm a little kooby happy because of my recent uh, $40 high-value purchase on Amazon, which I'll show you later in the state of the collection. Uh, but I have been, I've been digging on this kooby here, Vagrant. I uh, really like this little knife. Another gift from Dave. Geez, it's the Dave show right here. Uh, but uh, thanks again, Dave. Uh, really, really dig this Kubi. This is designed by Max Chichuk. This Vagrant comes in a number of different colors. Uh, that's G10. That's a liner lock. I really like Kubi's uh, um, branded pivot. I think it's really nice. Anyway, this model comes in a number of different G10 colors and two different blade shapes. One like this, more worn cliffy with that swale on the top of the blade. And uh, nice bellied Warrencliffe, I should say, <clears throat> with a nice point 
but it also comes with a sheep's foot that has a smooth domed, not domed, but a smooth curved spine down to a more flat edge. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so yeah, Kubi makes it really, really good knife for quite uh, a, a good price. This is on bearings, comes out with authority, very, very smooth, very good detent on this knife. Great jimping, very sharp. Aus 10 blade steel, you don't see too much. I've only actually seen Aus 10 uh, on cold steel, I think, on the whole. I guess it's appearing elsewhere, but cold steel really took advantage of the of the Aus 10 as they did the Aus 8. Um, and then lastly, thirdly, on my person today is one that I haven't worn in a while, but this used to get a whole lot of airtime. This is the um, Tops Rapid Strike. Now I have this one double-edged, very nice sheath. Uh, and I, I like these clips that they that they put on some of their Tops knives. Not a huge fan of that big rotating clip that they have. It's it's it. You can remove it, but it, it also leaves a, a peaked sort of well, it leaves a mesa uh, bulging out of the side of the sheath. So it, it's basically if you don't use that rotating spring clip on one of those tops knives, it's it's you may as well just make another sheath. Uh, so I was happy that this one did not come with that, but it also did not come with this. I put this on from I think the felony stop or one of my other other knives. So great sheath on this. But let's talk about this knife. The Rapid Strike is a double-edged knife here, and I I uh, requested this one double-edged. You can buy it either way. And I did modify the handle to make it smaller and uh, less pointy on the pommel, so it's uh, easier to carry and, uh, and to use in this reverse grip. But I want to talk about the blade here. So this is a double-edged blade, and it's a straight blade. So you might think, oh, is this a dagger? And I would say no. Now, this... this uh, Book of Weapons, which I highly recommend by the Diagram Group. It's full, It's a full history of weapons from Stone Age weapons to nukes. And uh, it's got everything in it is illustrated in these incredible etchings and incredible line drawings. Very cool book. Uh, my brother Vic and I poured over this for years and years and years and years um, all through our childhood and, and uh, adolescence. And it uh, was very, very well thumbed. I think my brother has the original and I found this uh, Barnes and Noble or something like that. Uh, anyway, uh, very good book. They would say that this is a dagger. I would not. I would say that because it lacks symmetry, it's not a dagger. This is a double-edged fighter for sure, um, but not a dagger. In any case, this is what I carried uh, fixed blade today. Didn't remove it once until right about now. And uh, that's the way it should be, uh, unless I'm practicing drawing it and, uh, you know, uh, playing in front of the mirror where no one can see. I, I say, do your Carenza like no one's watching. and uh, uh, But I didn't. Not today. So these were my three knives. I had the uh, dagger-like but not dagger, Boker Smatchet, uh, the wonderful Kubi Vagrant, and then the also dagger-like but not a dagger, Rapid Strike by Tops, Double-edged. Let me know what you were carrying today. Call the listener line, 17. 2446644487 or leave a comment down below happily uh like taking in that information and <clears throat> i find it inspirational there are knives like this kubi vagrant for instance that i would not have gone out of my way to get but because it was uh donated by someone it's that's basically that's a tacit recommendation and i took that recommendation and ended up being exposed to something I wouldn't have exposed myself to and really, really benefiting. So please leave a comment. Let me know what you're carrying. And maybe you get some of that from this show. That would be great. And if you do, if you get any information from this show that you think is valuable, whether it's from the uh, interviews we do every week with knife makers and manufacturers and luminaries of the knife world, if you think that's valuable, you like listening to those conversations, or uh, you like the other knife content like this show or Thursday Night Knives, which is always a blast, and you want to support the show, think about doing it on Patreon. We have a couple of different tiers of support. And at the top tier of support uh, right now, before we add a ludicrous level of support, uh, we uh, offer a monthly knife giveaway. And for every uh, level of support, you get uh, interview extras and other content. So this is the hard sell. Consider uh, supporting the show on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to go over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, 
That's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Best Tech Knives. Uh, man alive, do I like Best Tech Knives. And uh, to be honest, I don't have any currently in my collection branded as Best Tech Knives, but I have a number of outstanding knives like a Vero Engineering Synapse and uh, several off-grid knives that are made by uh, Best Tech. And they are really, really good. I think maybe because they were later to the scene than Riot and Wee and Reich, uh, they were looked at as the little brother on the on the block. I think, I think that Best Tech does amazing work. Anyway, um, though I did, <laughs> I did give the what was it called the Best Tech Kendo that I had. Kendo. <clears throat> uh, it was a a a, a, a um, Tanto early on in Best Tech. Very nice uh, knife. I think it was called the Kendo. Anyway, I gave it to my buddy Drew, who uses his knives hard, and he gave it back to me broken, like at the at the Ricasso blade broken. I was like, what did you do with this? He's like, you know, I don't know, opening up ammo cans or I, I don't know what the hell he was doing with it, but uh, he did break that best tech, but he was not using it the way it should be used. So best tech knives, awesome is what I'm getting at. Well, they they're tapping new talent for a knife that they're coming out with called the Titan. And it is a fantastic looking Tanto, if you ask me. And if you ask Ben Schwartz of Knife News, he'll tell you that this is a combination of American Tanto with that with that very distinct secondary point near the tip and Japanese Tanto, where you have that forward edge, in this case, curved because a traditional Japanese Tanto from tip to Ricasso, it's it's a gentle it's a curve. Uh, not a facet like you see on Americanized Tantos. So this one uh, brings these both together, and uh, I think I think it's a really good looking knife. Um, and it's it's in the D2 G10 setup here. And as you can see, uh, or if you can't see this uh, this product sample that Best Tech sent out uh, in this photograph here has JG10 with the black blade, which warms the cockles of my heart. I love that color combination. I know a lot of people are turned off by G10. I mean, by natural J G10. It's a very, very polarizing material. Uh, I'm on the side of yes, please. Uh, and so I love the way this one looks. Uh, but also, I think it's cool that they're there. This is a, a brand new untested designer name, Keanu Alfaro. Is that not a cool name? Keanu Alfaro? pretty cool anyway uh this guy's a uh, he's a designer product designer and uh i think he's done a beautiful job here i i think that this guy must like knives he's not just a product designer he's he, he must be a knife junkie but i do like this combination of americanized tanto and japanese tanto that blade is 2.94 inches and uh, i don't see a lanyard hole this is uh maybe it's got a uh, maybe it's got a little post how do you feel about about lanyards? I I'm all for them. I or, or fobs. You know, I don't I don't actually carry my knives on lanyards, but a little little thing on the end. I like the option on a small knife. I don't like when I don't have the option. Like on this Kubi Vagrant, I would love to put a little a little thing on there, a little paracord or leather fob on there because I love this knife and it means a lot to me. Uh, I'd like to commemorate it with a fob. They don't give me that option. Come on, people. All right. So anyway, that's the Best Tech Titan designed by a, a dude named Keanu Alfaro. And uh, we're all looking forward to it. Japanese Tanto meets American Tanto. Uh, coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at my new Kubi and then a couple of other new cool things uh, that have come in here. Maybe you saw me flash one of those cool things a few moments ago. And then daggers. Plain and simple. Daggers. Love them. All coming up right here on the Knife Junkie podcast. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. So it's been an exciting week here. After mm, several weeks of very little uh, USPS action at my door, uh, by design, I'm trying to save up a little bit here. Uh, I did have a recent uh, sort of break from that and got a couple of things because one thing you'll see, you'll see at the end of the state of the collection uh, was actually a drop. I got in on a drop, you know, a, a low number um, uh, output of a product I wanted, and I actually got it. Uh, that never happens. So uh, I'll show that off proudly. But first, um, 
you know, I was talking about that Kubi Vagrant that I like so much. Well, I decided I'd check out another Kubi and through this on a recent Amazon order. And at $40, I, I'm a little amazed. I'm quite amazed at how awesome this knife is. Okay. This is the Kubi Flash. And then it's got some numbers after it. And I don't, if, if I have a name like Flash, I'm not going to bother with the numbers. Uh, uh, just by, by the way there, they did give you a, a lanyard hole on this big knife where I don't need it. But anyway, this is the flash all blacked out except for the flats on that beautiful worn bellied worn cliff blade. Ergonomic handle remains neutral enough if you need to if you need to change your grip, but gives you almost a pistol grip. However, the way it cants the blade, it doesn't give you that effect. It just puts the point exactly where you want it for two things, utility cuts and for knowing exactly where that point is if you're thrusting it. Uh, this is a nearly four inch blade. I think that's 3.84. It's D2 steel. And of course, G10. I really like how they took this uh, branded Kubi pivot that I was showing you before. You can see the KB. And they totally blacked it out with that matte black. The rest of the hardware is black. <coughs> uh, very cool. Uh, something I was talking about on the uh, Thursday Night Knives the other night when I pulled this out, it was when Kubi first came out a couple of years ago, or at least came to prominence with some of my uh, trusted voices on YouTube, I, I was turned off by the logo. Look, I, I try, I try to, I'm like a Seinfeld character. I just try to find anything that can turn me off of a knife because I will buy them all. I want every one of them. So each knife that comes out, I have to figure out why I don't want it. And with Kubi knives, everyone's like, oh, my God, these things are awesome. I really like the designs of them. And they were inexpensive. And I, so you know what stopped me from buying like 500 Kubi knives when they first came to prominence was the logo, which you can barely see here. Should have gotten the box out. Actually, I got the box right here. So this this logo, it's kind of a kind of a skull with a beret and a star and headphones. <laughs> I was like, what the hell is that? That is, that's, they're mixing their metaphors here. I, I thought it was cheese. I was like, I, I don't get it. So that's good. And it's got a skull and that's not my favorite motif. So I don't need to bother with Kubi knives. That's, you know, it's ridiculous. But it's a good justification that has stopped me from going broke. I mean, that's a good system of justification. Anyway, what do I like about this Kubi knife? It has outstanding action it's the kind of action that you uh first couple of times it wasn't this smooth and then after like 10 flips super smooth and then and then i'm checking the pivot oh is there play is there blade play is that why it's so smooth no it's just super smooth first 10 gets rid of the dust from packaging and then boom you're you're in motion uh really excellent lock bar access there you can see the jimped rise there from the clip side, and then a, a little bit of a void here, so you can easily grab it. Uh, very nicely jimped, but not in any harsh way. I usually do not like jimping on a lock bar. I prefer some sort of uh, chamfered uh, surface to sort of wedge your thumb in there, but this one feels really good. Uh, it feels really good, and it releases the lock. Uh, it releases the blade so smoothly uh, it that also made me feel a little suspicious, but I checked it all out. <laughs> it all, it, it's all just very nicely done, and for very little money. Um, and if you follow uh, the, how does that work? How can they do that? If you follow it, it often leads to unpleasant places. Uh, so this is the conflict I have with buying knives like this. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that right here. What I am going to say is. Uh, I am very impressed with Kubi knives, and um, I'm happy to have this in my collection. It might end up being a um, a giveaway knife at some point. Um, uh, you know, it just depends. Here's the thing. Here's here's the why to that. Uh, if it's a four inch blade, usually um, usually I'm not going to carry it unless it's fancy. I mean, I'll just say it unless it's one of the uh, fancier knives that I really like. Uh, if it's a, th a three inch knife like this one, I'm much more apt to carry it. If it's not fancy, fancy, that's my, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so this might end up on the giveaway block at some point, but for now it's, it's a really, really excellent knife. I'm going to figure out, uh, see if it's excellent over time and 
we'll go from there. So that's the Kubi Flash, ironically named uh, because of its <laughs> due to its black, uh, quote unquote, murdered out appearance. I don't like that term. I'm, I'm not going to use that again. Um, OK, I'm going to take a sip of coffee here. And move on to another knife from a company that that uh, is again killing it, came onto the scene, killing it. And then I felt like um, uh, sort of. Um, I don't want to say faded from view. They did not fade from view, but for a couple of years there, I felt like they, they kind of dipped a little. Anyway, it was Kaiser knives, uh, not to leave you on tenter hooks here. I got a new Kaiser knife and it is the Pelican mini. And it is from my buddy K Max Rom from France. Uh, uh, Jonathan Renaudin, the designer K Max Rom. I've, I've been following him for years on Instagram. And then I had him on the show and, I love his designs and then have recently gone on a tear. Uh, I got I got the Preta 2 uh, from Concept Knives in both the Tanto and Clip Point and uh, Titanium Handle and uh, Micarta Handle. That's two knives. That's not four. I, I got them in those two combinations. And, uh, and then I also already had the Pelican by Concept, which looks different from this Pelican by Kaiser, but Pelican is a uh, knife he's been making for years and, and it generally has this shape and he's made Pelicans in Tanto and Pelicans in this sort of clip point. But um, a big part of that design language is this generous thumb swale in the spine of the blade. And you'll see that across his designs. It's an element that I really like because it, it ends up creating this, this double peaked, double humped, spine on both the tanto and on the clip point and it's a design um element that i love ever since the first time i saw the mac v sog um bowie knife in maybe terminator 2 in 1991 i think that's the first time i saw that knife um but here's a brian brown raptor that has that double peaked uh clip point i i i just love that shape and the pelican knives and the k max rom knives with their uh, ever present and generous thumb swell on the spine creates that look. And so I've always been compelled by his designs. This thing uh, made by Kaiser is outstanding. I mean, uh, the blade is super thin. It's, it's a nice, uh, it's a, it's a decent blade stock, but it, it comes to a very thin edge. Uh, it's a flat ground blade and just really stupidly sharp. I, I, I am really happy that Kaiser is making such awesome knives. I think they always were. I think it was a perception in my mind about them slipping. Um, I don't, I don't see why they would have, I know that, uh, some of their designers broke off and made concept some or a designer of theirs broke off and made concept and another brand that I think is awesome. Um, I don't think that would have affected the whole Kaiser company. So I think maybe that was a perception I had, but um, anyway, a really nice micarta that showed up real gray, which I love because this one has started to take on patina nicely. And when you see the the gray, when you see the uh, kind of the epoxy part of the of the um, at the epoxy and the raw fibers of the micarta, I always feel like that's the the kind of micarta that's going to take on patina the best. Um, sometimes. It doesn't sometimes I just don't carry the knife enough and use the knife enough to create a patina in that uh, micarta. But I do love that. Uh, the detent on this is pretty stiff. I find it uh, uh, at first I found it kind of painful unless I had exactly the right angle on it uh, with my with my right thumb, with my left thumb, oddly, maybe because it's on the same side of the lock. It's it's harder to flick out, but easier to slow roll out and harder to slow roll out over here but easier to flick i don't know and then and then middle finger flicking is catch as catch can with me but i've been this has been a car knife for uh, a week now i've been fiddling with it and breaking it in very nicely i i do recommend this knife i actually uh was kind of on the fence about it or i knew it existed and then it and then i i my weird justification for not getting this one was that it didn't have a swedge and i thought it needed one and of course it doesn't uh but then i saw um stella's knife obsession she's uh, someone i follow on instagram uh she got one of these 
and was flicking it. I was like, oh, it's time. And so uh, she inspired me to get this. And so here it is. I really, really like this. This has been my back pocket secondary a lot over the past uh, week that I've had this. Very nice knife. Okay, that's, uh, by the way, that uh, blade steel is uh, N690CO. N690 is a Ital is a uh, steel used a lot by the Italian manufacturers. It's it's German, right? Bowler. And, uh, or is that Austrian? Uh, geez, I, sh I shouldn't speak about stuff I don't know, but I seem to do it all the time. Uh, but it's one of the blade steels that uh, Kaiser uses in their Vanguard line. And it's a good steel. Uh, for a budget steel. All right, last but not least, certainly not least in the state of the collection are these. That's right, be nice. So these are aluminum knuckles uh, that I got from Jonathan McNeese, McNeese Knives. Here, let's let this focus a little bit. Um, all right, well, I'll just hold them like this. Uh, these are single uh, billet aluminum milled uh, knuckles. I've always wanted knuckles. And uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan McNeese, besides making the McBee and the, and the Mac 3 and 3.5 and the other cool knives he makes, he makes a cool self-defense knife, double ring hooked self-defense knife. He, he makes a lot of cool little things uh, aside from knives. And when I saw this on his um, Instagram page, I jumped at it and then I missed it. And then he did another run and I got it. And so to me, that's a, that's a victory. But this also starts, and if you, wait, hang on, let's see. So on the front of these knuckles, it says, be nice, which I love. And on the back, it says, uh, McNeese knives. So this has started something. <clears throat> I've wanted brass knuckles forever. For a long time, they were hard to come by and illegal and now, who knows if they're legal? I don't know. Uh, but uh, I want some. And, and there are a lot of different historical designs of brass knuckles. And I, I want some of the of the classic style. This is kind of a classic style uh, where you have the, the piece that fits into your palm and then the finger holes suspended above it. And so it opens up your fist, but also presents those knuckles. Uh, so this one in particular, I find these edges a little harsh, these corners a little harsh. I took it out uh, to our heavy bag and pounded on it a little bit. And no doubt the heavy bag was crying and hurting, uh, but my palm was not loving the experience either. So these would be good with a pair of gloves on for sure. You know, like those tight black leather gloves you wear when you're going to do wet work. You put these on and uh, and you get your information. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but I like the be nice part of it because that's the thing. If you ever have to put these on, it means someone's being menacing and someone's being a jerk. And, uh, well, they deserve to have that little imprint on their cheek uh, if, if, they, if they need to get it. Of course, uh, this is me just playing. I don't go out and get in street fights, and I certainly uh, am not you know, hitting people with brass knuckles. But they're fascinating bits of, of uh, defensive kit. And they come in some really beautiful designs. And now with Instagram and just the Internet in general and just the opening up of things and the loosening of some weapons laws, uh, we can find these more and more. And so uh, I, I'm going to seek some more out. Now, funny thing is uh, we're driving around. I was doing errands with my daughter and I brought this with and she's, she's, you know, we're walking into different stores and she's like, can I carry the knuckles? I'm like, sure. Just, you know, put them in your pocket. And she liked the, so she wants me to get her a pair. And I said, not yet. First of all, your hands are too small, uh, you know, to make it work, but you know, maybe we can start with some G10 knuckles or some, you know, a GRN knuckles. You can find those uh, brass knuckles that are not made out of brass. They're just made out of plastic. But uh, anyway, uh, I like I like these modern women. I, I like that they like their brass knuckles. What can I say? Uh, all right. So next up on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to talk about something important. We're going to talk about daggers. Uh, as I as I discussed before, I showed this weapons book. I just I just want to sh show you something real quick. Uh, let's see if I don't know if it'll fit under the knife cam, but I'm, sh I'm sure it will. So this is a great book. Uh, just incidentally, you got to check this thing out. Uh, each each chapter shows how different weapons work and and blows them up and shows diagrams and then talks about historical, uh, you know, uh, 
historical battles where certain weapons were used, that kind of thing. But I just want to I just want to read how they define dagger here. Daggers. One of the basic ways to kill or wound is to stab. The dagger is the simplest stabbing weapon. It is short bladed, held in one hand, and while used primarily for thrusting, uh, many will also cut in the manner of a domestic knife. As one man, let's see, where, as one man's basic weapon is found in all parts of the world and has been used since the Stone Age, uh, and you can see these various diagrams for different daggers. But the funny thing is, is that they list all of these as daggers. I would say Chinquidia, yes. Whatever this is, it's like a dirk, yes. This Chris double-edged and symmetrical. Yes, even though it's wavy bladed. Yes, Conjar, no. Uh, whatever this is, I'm not sure what that is. No, and Bowie, no. In my estimation, I think that it's got to be symmetrical, pretty much, and it's got to be double-edged. Now you say, but this Chris is not symmetrical. It's all of, it kind of is. It's kind of symmetrical. Uh, so I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to end with that. Kind of symmetrical. Whereas the Conjar, and what is this thing? Uh, uh, a double curved Persian or Indian blade, even though it's double edged, is not. So that's what we're going on here. And then also, I I want to say this: a dagger is also not this. Here is a a, a completely double edged, nearly near dagger. This is a um, loveless mod, uh, a loveless model. Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Sub hilt fighter, and you can see or if you cannot see, it has a long, slender, seven-inch blade. And the bottom edge, the main cutting edge, as it would be uh, when held in hand, uh, is that of a bowie, and then, or is that of a dagger. But the top edge is that of a bowie. So it, it runs parallel to the main edge to about uh, two-thirds of the way towards the tip, and then it takes a clip down towards the tip, if you, if you can uh, detect that. It's all sharp, so it's uh, you know stem to stern sharp and double edged like a dagger, but it's not shaped like a dagger because it's not a symmetrical spear point. That's how I'm defining it, and uh, let's get on with it. All right, so this first one is an out the front automatic. This is a Microtech Troodon, and it is not symmetrical. It is symmetrical in blade. Uh, however, the top edge is serrated. To me, it still counts because uh, it's two sharp edges on a symmetrical spear point blade. Uh, when you look at the handle, happily, it's not symmetrical. Uh, I find symmetrical handles somewhat troublesome because my hand is not symmetrical. And so I, I do understand that it allows you to, a symmetrical handle will allow you to turn it either way and make it work. And with a dagger, that's ideal, right? Because um, you have two edges that you're working with. But here, uh, I find that even though this is very asymmetrical and fits in the hand nicely like this, it does also work perfectly flipped upside down. As a matter of fact, I prefer it that way because it puts the thumb forward on this jimping that should be, uh, that's generally on the lower side where your forefinger is. And then further back at the back end of this actuating uh, slide, is another bit of jimping for your forefinger, which naturally rests further back behind the pad of your thumb. So upside down, I think the, the Troodon and the Ultratech, you'll see in a minute, work even better. Uh, but this to me is a dagger. It is uh, a, a great double-edged implement. This one uh, is troublesome, I gotta say. This particular specimen is troublesome. If you saw, I just... Uh, it just failed. It, it, I do have to send this in ever since I got it. It's been a problem child. Uh, I even bought it thinking I was getting a combat Troodon, which is an inch larger than this. Um, and thinking I was getting a great deal. I rushed into the purchase, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Okay. So there it is. The, the, the Microtech Troodon, I think they're best looking out the front, um, dagger. Incidentally, that's the small version of the large version that was used in John Wick 2, <laughs> sort of. Okay, next up is the Ultratech. Now, another Microtech out the front. It is not a common thing. I did not preface this, but it is not a common thing to find a dagger in a folding knife. Like before, 
I, when I was talking about this, it is not uh, all that uncommon to find a dagger grind without a sharp edge on top. To me, that's just a tease. Um, I love this knife, but it's a tease. Uh, a true dagger is hard to do because the whole blade has to nestle into the handle. The detent has to be tuned so perfectly so that it does not come out. And, uh, you know, it can be, it can, it, it doubles the danger. It doubles the illegality. Um, so they're not as common. Um, and as we know, most people carry folding knives as opposed to fix, as opposed to fixed blade knives. So they're less apt to carry a folding dagger. All right. So here we go. This one is such a beaut. I love this knife. Uh, the UT, uh, not the UTX, the Ultra Tech. This is the full size 3.4 inch dagger blade with the sharpened top edge and the blackened um, bevels. I just think their Ultra Tech blades are gorgeous. I, I'm not a big fan of the Drop Point Ultra Tech blade, but this and the Tonto are just gorgeous on the utx not a fan of their other tantos on the, out the fronts like the large like the troodon tanto i don't like the look of that but uh god this thing is awesome so same deal with the handle it is not symmetrical symmetrical it is very neutral stick like but it's not symmetrical uh equally comfortable with the sh with the uh serrated edge up or down because again, it gives you that option for a bit more of a natural grip here. Uh, when you have it uh, in standard position and your thumb resting up against the slide, well, your forefinger, your whole hand is further back on the handle and your forefinger is not engaging uh, that bottom jimping at all. Um, so if you turn it over, that, that forefinger jimping becomes the thumb jimping and the slide becomes the finger guard for the forefinger. And you can do that because the blade is double-edged and symmetrical. Well, not symmetrical because it's half serrated, but you get it. Gorgeous knife. This one has a very stiff action, but very reliable action, unlike the Troodon. I'm going to send the Troodon to boarding school, military school, see what happens. Uh, I think we have the kernel of something great here, but we just need to forge it into a cooperative young out the front okay next up is the uh i was about to say arch nemesis it is not i wish that were in this lineup this is the antimatter also a beautiful folding dagger but this one is not automatic uh this is one of the few uh frame lock folders or just regular folding knives that lock uh, that has a dagger uh, fully sharpened dagger blade hinderer makes the maximus that's one um, sharp by design, Brian Nadeau makes the Arch Nemesis, my dream folder. I love that. Uh, that's one of my grail knives for sure. And then um, uh, Israel Bacchus and his company, Arcane Design, uh, got together, collaborated with Something Obscene Company to come up with this a few years ago. And wow, did it turn my head. Uh, manufactured by Riyadh and designed by, uh, by Israel and Something Obscene Company, uh, Felix, this is a fully symmetrical, fully double-edged, though you can get it single-edged if you need to, uh, dagger that can wave out of your pocket with the quillion. Of course, this being a dagger, you have to be careful when closing. Uh, you can't touch the back of that blade, but uh, you can use the quillion on the top here, or you can just let that fine riot action and gravity take care of things. Beautiful um bronze and tumbled black anodizing on this titanium i think it is gorgeous and then it has this <clears throat> cool science fiction inspired clip which uh if you've listened to any of the interviews with israel you know that he is uh, very inspired by science fiction and 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 ideas and theories about the future and space travel and all this kind of stuff so you can see a lot of futuristic uh, sort of design flourishes in his work. This actually, if you ask me, happens to be his most traditional design because um, some of his other designs like the Warncliffe and the Tanto and his new clip point uh, hybrid, they all look very futuristic. This to me looks like it could go through, it could be any, any time. This could exist in any time throughout history, kind of. Um, 
except for the execution, of course, with the ceramic ball bearings and the and the um, titanium and all that. The reason I opted for this model, they have a um, they made one with a damascus steel blade. I didn't opt for that because it was way too expensive uh, from for for my capacity at the time. And then they had one with the black blade and this color handle or the black and the black and the black. And they all looked cool. I actually liked the black blade with this handle best until I realized that with this knife, you would be getting this gorgeous and sumptuously beautiful uh, machine satin that I love that Riyadh does here. So I decided to go with that because I figured this double-edged quadruple beveled blade would be dazzling with that with that machine satin on it. And I would spend hours gazing at its beauty. A cool thing about this is that it's got that fuller right down the center, which which lightens it and adds rigidity, making it in cross-section kind of like an I-beam. Um, so that is a bit of old tech that you keep seeing in knives. That's what's so cool about knives. It's a straight line, just like you and just like I am, uh, you know, the product of a straight line of successful breeding throughout history back to the caveman days. Well, that fuller is kind of the same thing. The fuller worked, you know, in the medieval days, the fuller worked in the days of Odysseus and, and, the, and the bronze swords. Fuller still works on this futuristic uh, antimatter by arcane designs. Love this thing. All right, putting it down and moving on. This next one is a design originally by A.G. Russell, a knife making uh, legend who uh, died maybe two years ago now or a year ago. Uh, rest in peace. But he left a huge impact on the knife world. And this is a very popular knife. Uh, this iteration is by CRKT. It's a uh, single drop forged uh, version of his fancier Sting dagger uh so do you recognize this uh you might see the uh, well this is a very popular knife this crkt version uh but they the ag russell version has uh there are there are different kinds but like polished black micarta with a uh aluminum shiny aluminum bolster and just a lot of different uh, uh sort of really nicely dressed up versions of this knife this is what does it say here um let's see sting by ag russell okay it's forged 1050 1050 steel okay so for a long time this was a bathroom knife this one resided this was a gift by the way from my awesome brother-in-law james uh years ago but this resided in the bathroom for a while not in the shower but uh over by my shaving kit and uh anything in the bathroom that has a blade uh has a red fob on it so that it can be easily recognized and brought to bear if need be. You know, the bathroom is a place where you're pretty vulnerable. You shouldn't forget about self-defense in the bathroom. In any case, uh, <laughs> uh, I put this long one on because this knife uh, in a thrust kind of requires you to go. I'm, I'm more used to holding a, a knife in this fashion where the spine of the blade lines up with my thumb. But it's, it doesn't feel so secure that way. This knife is more of a flat with your thumb in that depression. It, and it locks in uh, these two symmetrical swales here. Lock in the, in the forefinger and then the butt of the, the uh, pommel kind of nestles in the thumb. And that's pretty good. But it still feel, feels slippery to me, even especially if it's in the bathroom and there's condensation on it from the shower or whatever. Um, so I added this so that I could just loop my hand in there, just like that. It doesn't need nothing complicated, but just so I could loop my fingers in there, just in case I needed to thrust this and my, my hand slipped up, it, would, it wouldn't uh, be the end of my hand. So, um, you know, is this born out of experience and necessity? No, but it's born out of imagination and fear, uh, you know, a healthy fear. Uh, it's, you know, heaven forbid, but I don't want to not prevail because I didn't have uh, something in the bathroom to fight with just in case. I know you think I'm nuts and that's fine, um, but but it helps me pass the time. <laughs> anyway, very, very great, uh, very cool knife and a classic. And it comes in this uh, um, thermal mold plastic sheath with with 
um, with nylon over it. And, and you have two options that you can carry it, uh, scout style or, oh no, you don't have two options. You can carry it scout style. Or you can loop it onto your Molly. Oh, but the thing is, I always thought the retention on this was rather light. Uh, but then I met a guy, at my old martial arts school who used to ride a motorcycle everywhere. And he carried this on his belt and he had it rigged upside down on his belt and it never fell off. So, uh, it doesn't rattle in there. It's pretty secure in there, but I always just thought it removed. It came out. It came out too easily, but apparently it's stout and sturdy enough to, uh, to take the jostling, um, of a motorcycle, uh, riding upside down on, on a belt. Uh, the CRKT Sting, nice little dagger, and it is, uh, it's pretty inexpensive, and I think you can still find them. Um, all right, next up is a really cool kind of dagger uh, that I only have this one of, but I recently mentioned I'd like to get a custom one of these. Anyway, I'm talking about the Vaunted Push Dagger. This is the Cold Steel Safekeeper. And uh, as Jim and I were quipping before we started rolling, um, there was a period of time where all of the knives that Lynn Thompson named sounded like peacekeeper, safekeeper, uh, all combinations of these kind of things. Um, and so I can never remember which one is which, but this one is the safekeeper two. Safekeeper one was a double edged with a, with a void in the blade. This one is a single edge. What is this? One, two, three and a half inches of double edged OS eight. I believe that is just wickedly sharp hollow hollow ground which really helps uh like that article in that book was saying uh the primary function of a dagger is thrusting uh but you can get some slashing and cutting uh if you if you handle the geometry correctly so some of my favorite daggers have hollow ground blades and uh, that hollow grind makes the blade thin enough that a slash is realistic to pull off uh, otherwise, if you're going just for straight, rigid thrusting, those edges are going to be oblique and, you know, you might split instead of cut um, if it's soft uh, material. So this thing, this was made in Japan. Very nice. And this is an older one. Uh, this is when they first started, first switched over from their... Um, leather sheaths to kydex and for something like this a uh, kydex is much much more welcome um because it's more realistic for carry in my situation though i rarely carry this i'll i'll, I'll every once in a while i'll pull it out and be like i should carry a push dagger why not i carry fixed blades all the time and i think push daggers are cool and i have this one um but this handle is the is the grippy checkered uh craton that cold steel uses it's great to keep it in your hand apparently it's great when wet and all that but uh you know since i carry in the in the waistband i don't like the way it feels rubbing against my um my sculpted obliques and i also don't like how it kind of tugs at my shirt because it's a rubbery material so i end up carrying this not too much at one point i thought about wrapping it in sports tape you know or or uh uh, you know, that white tape. But then I thought, then I'll just look like a criminal. Then then I just look like I'm gonna, I'm trying to, you know, I'm thinking I'm going to use this. <laughs> so I, I avoided that. Um, so anyway, the push dagger. The idea is it's in your hand. You're gripping uh, the grip like this. There's no way or, or it's very difficult to disarm. Uh, a traditional uh, straight bladed knife, you might be able to disarm in in various ways this one is short so it'd be very difficult to disarm but there might be various ways you can you can grab a knife out of someone's hand if you create pain in other places and and distract you know whatever i don't know i don't know this is all theoretical from from you know practicing in a in a in a martial arts school but uh theoretically you can disarm a straight blade much much easier than you can this because you can't access that grip it's buried in there and then the only thing that protrudes from the hand is on unfriendly so uh, you would have to create a lot of pain elsewhere and uh, maybe on the wrist and on the top of the hand and on the arm uh, to 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 disarm this thing to let so, so the person voluntarily or involuntarily lets go um, as opposed to stripping it out so there are a lot of uh, people people like the karambit for that reason people like various other uh, uh, kind of knives that that 
are captured in your hand for one reason or another, uh, thinking that it, it can't be disarmed. Of course, anything can happen. You could trip and fall and go like this and try and catch yourself and drop your push dagger. So uh, it's it, nothing is a, uh, a guarantee, but no doubt in the hands of a badass or someone who's used to fighting and, and has intention, that is an awful, awful weapon to come up against. Okay, next up, this is the only one that is not symmetrical in the blade. But it is, but it isn't. Uh, this is a modern, I'm going to call this a modern modified. Since since in the knife world, we can just throw modified in front of stuff and be justified in whatever comes after it. I'm going to call this a modified pistol grip dagger. This is the felony stop. A lacy Zabo design uh, made by Tops. They still make this. Tops, I love Tops knives. I love pretty much everything they do that I've ever held. And I love drooling over pretty much everything they make but i have a special soft spot in my heart for their smaller self-defense knives they're very nasty and imaginative and um really are optimized for carry and so i i do love that about them uh and this felony stop was the first one that i fell in love with and so let me show this so this i contend is a dagger it is a modified pistol grip dagger Okay, pistol grip, you see why, that's obvious. You've got this curved handle uh, that com that curves down from the uh, blade in a pretty dramatic fashion. And so if you're holding it in a saber grip, uh, you get, you, you're holding this pistol grip in a saber grip like this, you get that point forward in a way that allows you to get that point where it needs to be without having to torque your wrist. Um, at all and and so this to me would be an ideal knife for someone who's got a lot of firearms training uh because the grip feels kind of um maybe might feel natural to someone who's who holds a pistol a lot great thing about this knife it has that thumb swale so you can put a lot of power behind your cuts also when it's in reverse grip you can use that thumb swale for trapping uh your opponent's limb it sort of uh, acts as an as a way uh, as a way to capture right in this space. Why is this a modified dagger? Well, look at it. If you look, at, okay, if you cover up the, the back portion of the knife and just look at the first two inches of that blade, it is a symmetrical spear point blade. The top edge terminates at that swale to allow for different grips, but this is a dagger. And, and the reason I say modified is because the bottom edge is twice as long as the top edge but it's for a purpose and and ultimately that front business end is symmetrical and spear point so i contest that this thing is a dagger and and so that's that's how i feel <laughs> i love this knife uh as as i do most of most of them but this one in particular uh, i know lacy zabo has designed so many really interesting uh uh, com not combat, but self-defense and tactical oriented knives. Uh, one he's known for by name is the Zabo, uh, the Spyderco Zabo knife, that big curved upswept, um, uh, harpooned Persian blade thing is awesome. Uh, I, I happen to know that, uh, our buddy Stu at stone and steel up in Vermont has one. They're hard to find and he's got one. So, uh, you can look him up. All right, so there is the felony stop by Tops. Next is another Cold Steel. Surprise, surprise. Uh, do love the Cold Steel. And this one I had, gave away, and then just recently bought uh, another version, someone else's. Uh, so this here is the uh, Cold Steel Peacekeeper 2. So the Peacekeeper comes in, came, it's discontinued now, sadly, uh, came in two sizes. It came in this uh, five and a half inch bladed size. And then it came in a seven inch, a uh, more um, classic size um, combat dagger. I have the trainer for that and uh, want to get that one too. But I saw this one on the on blade forums. Someone was selling some old cold steels. And this one was one I've always wanted to get back. Gave it to a friend in Philly years ago, the one that I had. And... Um, kind of regretted it the moment I did it, but he gave me a really great pair of American optical sunglasses. So it was a fair trade 
I still have those sunglasses. Hopefully he still has the knife. Uh, a very comfortable handle here. This is, uh, that, again, that Craton. And this is an older knife now. And I can't help but feel that the Craton starts to break down. It feels suspiciously mm, tacky to me, you know, just, just to the touch. But, you know, what are you going to do? Stop time? Uh, the handle on this one is a little smaller, obviously, than the 7-inch one. I'm used to the 7-inch because of the trainer that I have. Um, so I'm used to a larger handle in this forward grip. And, you know, it, with a dagger, you're pretty much limited in the forward grip to a saber grip like this or a sideways grip like this. But you cannot do a Filipino grip where you're coming up and putting your thumb on there unless it's modified. Um, so I find this and the shorter handle on the dagger to be less comfortable in forward grip than in reverse grip. Uh, reverse grip, this knife is ideal. It's the perfect size for my hand and for capping the thumb. It's very comfortable. You That guard is uh, not only protrudes north and south, but also east and west. So you get a little action on the like Coke bottle action on the side and um, very grippy. I would feel very confident using this knife in either grip. Uh, but to me, it's more comfortable in reverse grip. Great thing about this knife, not only is the are the bevels hollow, this is a hollow ground, quad ground knife. Their, their current uh, budget daggers are chisel ground, which is also cool. It has a flat, almost convex side here, and then a, the, the crowned double bevel on top. But the great thing about this one is that all four bevels are hollow ground, so they get pretty thin behind the edge. And then from Ricasso to about an inch or two inches behind the tip, it swells out. It's not a parallel line it and and it's not a converging line it's a diverging line until it hits two bellies on the top and on the bottom and then come to that terminating point so those two bellies on both edges make this a much much better slasher than if it had just straight edges or a um or a diminishing edge to that point so i love the bellied nature of the daggers that lynn thompson has designed my next uh, uh, I hesitated doing this episode because there's one I really want to get, the Taipan. I've always wanted the cold steel Taipan. And uh, I will get that eventually. Um, and then I'll do a dagger update. But I uh, love the cold steel daggers for their bellied edges. And so they, they, they really maximize the blade for slashing and thrusting. And, and that's something that is, uh, well, it's valuable in a dagger. All right, next up, one of I was going to say probably the most beautiful, but uh, I really like this one. This is the Spartan Harzy Dagger. Uh, Spartan Blades, just out of North Carolina, makes amazing knives uh, right there in in North Carolina. And uh, and Bill Harzy out of the Great Northwest has been designing the coolest tactical knives for a, quite a while. You can spot his knives when you see him. He's got a nailed down design language even when i look at this uh dagger which is not necessarily known for doing daggers but when i look at this dagger i can tell it's a harzy i'm not removing it from the sheath yet because it is in this amazingly gorgeous chattanooga leatherworks sheath chattanooga leatherworks is uh, under the rmj umbrella rmj chattanooga leatherworks and american tomahawk all under the rmj label i believe they are also out of north carolina and, or no, uh, I guess Tennessee, um, and just making amazing, amazing stuff. But I love this sheath. So gorgeous. And this top part can be removed with these, uh, Chicago bolts here. And you can, uh, put a, uh, put some more discreet, uh, carry options on it. If you wanted to carry this knife and not for nothing for dagger for a full size dagger, this, this might be just the most carryable full size dagger uh that i can think of right now all right removing it from the sheath i just want to look at them at uh, one four five yes okay that's what i thought this is exactly six inches look at this beauty this is a beautiful knife now uh you can see that those edges are parallel and then start to uh terminate towards the edge about two-thirds of the way there uh, but these again are hollow ground bevels, though 
they are much steeper and uh, less broad bevels because you have that very rigid uh, raised spine, that medial ridge here, which has full thickness to right about there, and then it tapers down to that edge. So this one is definitely a thrusting. Um, this one is optimized for thrusting. That doesn't mean those edges aren't sharp. They are very sharp, very sharp. Uh, however, with the length of the bevels and uh, sort of the steepness of that, you might get a little less slashing power than you would out of, say, the safe keep. What is this? Peacekeeper, safekeeper, peacekeeper. Um, but uh, this thing, I, I mean, I don't think you're going to miss any performance with this. It is just a, um, and, and words, words fail with this dagger because to me, it's just a thing. Of, it's such a thing of beauty. S35 VN, you got William, uh, William Harsey's signature there on the Ricasso. You've got about an inch there. If you need to bring your finger up, into the uh, into the well here for whatever reason, uh, so it's not sharp right down there. I appreciate that um, sharp thruster. You've got a, an incredible Coke uh, bottle handle. This thing has me stultified. You've got a really really beautiful Coke bottle handle, and you as you turn it, you can see that it's really nicely contoured, but never does it feel unsure in hand. Sometimes round handles. Like if you've ever watched Forged in Fire, you'll hear Doug Markai to say this all the time. Uh, when testing blades or any of them, uh, when testing blades, if you have a round handle, it's going to turn and you're going to lose edge orientation or it's more likely to on impact turn and you will lose edge orientation. This one is nicely rounded, uh, but the contours on the spine uh, of the blade uh, around the tang are, are such that you have a very positive grip. You always know where your hand is. Uh, you've got this nice jimping for, uh, uh, top and bottom here. And then forward-facing quillions, uh, which I think are nice because they allow you to back that thrust with your thumb and your forefinger. So just a beautiful knife. Uh, uh, these handle scales are clamshelled on there and uh, so that tang is not exposed. And... Uh, a classic. I now I need, and this is a need and not a want, but I need the Les George Spartan Blades dagger, and then, and then I will be complete. I will be whole. All right. Second to last is an absolute classic, but not the absolute classic. Uh, here it is with the sheath. Yes, it's the Randall Model Two, seven, meaning seven inch blade. This is the Model Two combat stiletto this is a knife i've wanted for years and years and years and years and years and then um but never even considered it a because of the cost and b because of the five-year wait to get one uh made for you uh this is the exact configuration of this knife i always wanted stacked leather handles with the commando style handle um with uh, brass uh um, symmetrical quillions here and that seven inch blade any longer i, I think the eight inch blades uh, of might be a little bit too long uh for for being light in hand and that kind of thing and uh so anyway uh the way i got this was knife center they'll get shipments of randall blades and you got to jump on them because they go quickly but if you like randall knives uh, these legendary blades uh, you'll be psyched this one has some of that some of those same features as the Spartan Harzi. You have an unsharpened Ricasso area that you can wrap your finger around. I know that with um, there were there was a style of fighting with a Randall knife uh, with a Randall clip point, which has the clip sharpened, where you would put the main edge up and have that clip which was sharpened there, and you would bring your finger over the top. And uh, you get very nasty, percussive, gouging, tearing cuts when you use the back part of a Bowie like that. And uh, so I guess GIs learned that. And there was a Randall style of fighting where you where you had the, the edge, the main edge up and used that sharpened swedge. Uh, you can take advantage of that same thing here with this with this setup. And you can even thrust like this because this tall brass quillion uh, in the web of your thumb will stop you from sliding up onto that 
uh, onto that blade. And there is a generous bit of uh, ricasso for that. The blade itself is uh, flat ground. I don't know. You know what? I, I'm going to I'm going to recheck. Last time I checked, I determined it was flat. But no, it is hollow ground, slightly hollow ground. And again, you've got a nice bit of belly here for slashing. So not quite as bellied as the cold steel blades uh, towards the tip, but a nice rounded uh, surface here, uh, edge, edge profile, I mean, for slashing. So just a classic, classic. You got that nice long handle that works great in a saber grip like this. So a classic that was born out of no doubt this last one and this is the truest classic of the classics uh this is the fairbairn sykes this is the type three i believe uh fairbairn sykes mass manufactured at this point in the war i believe it was 1943 and 44 that this particular style came out my brother gave me this one um it's a little rough on the handle here it was seems like it was cast i'm not sure who the maker was at a certain point uh these the the making of these went far and wide in sheffield england uh but so what is this thing designed for it's designed for dispatching suckers i guess i mean look at it it is a purpose-driven weapon this is straight thrusting you can cut with that edge it's actually a very thin and sharp edge and it's a diamond in cross section this one is a little bit warped um but this is a, a a true to form dagger where um it is it has those edges that are it's basically a triangle it's basically a long thin triangle and um and it is meant for pushing past material past canvas and into flesh and that's what this is it's a beautiful knife, uh, and it has led to the design of many, many beautiful daggers. I, I greatly appreciate this one. Uh, my brother has given me so many cool gifts uh, in terms of historical knives. This one rests on the wall of fame behind me, and uh, I wouldn't mind getting a few other Fairbairn Sykes daggers just to have um, and hold. <laughs> All right, that's me. Uh, I've come to the end of this dagger lecture. Uh, I'll just run down. I got I got two Microtex. I got a uh, I got an arch nemesis. Oh, that's another Freudian slip. Sorry. I got an antimatter. I got a CRKT sting, a safekeeper, a peacekeeper, a felony stop, a Spartan Harzi, a combat stiletto, and a Fairbairn Sykes. Um, some of my favorite knives, these daggers. Hopefully, here soon you'll see me with a couple others. Like I said, I've had my eye on the pipe taipan for i don't know 100 years and so uh, i think it's it's time for me to pull the trigger on that one and uh i would like to get the omirta by boker and jason stout and then i've been eyeing up a bunch of customs on instagram god help me god help me all right coming up this sunday check out my interview with dan keffler what a cool guy do you know who dan keffler is you probably do he makes these incredible japanese swords and uh and, and the like, but he's really known for his cut. He's a, he's a champion blade sports guy and has designed some of the most successful choppers. And um, one of my favorite creations of his, the K18 double-edged short sword chopper. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. Anyway, check that out. That'll be on the podcast this Sunday. And then also be sure to join us tomorrow night for Thursday night knives right here on YouTube. You can also check it out on Facebook and Twitch and join the conversation. Speaking of which, download us wherever you listen to podcasts uh, right here to my, well, stage right. All right. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, I do implore you, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear
hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 